All right, then. So again, welcome to Senior College Night. We're going to go through some of the stuff that our high school seniors who are right in the process of starting these applications, or maybe they're a little bit further ahead and have some applications completed. Um, we're going to talk about all the ins and outs of that this evening. Again, I'm Karen Collins. I'm a college access specialist with Granite Advance, and I'm happy to be able to join you tonight. So first things first, we have what's called the Admissions Insider. And in this booklet, we have all kinds of information about the college process, kind of from start to finish in you know, sequential order throughout that, that um, Insider. And it is available online. So if you are interested in seeing a copy of that, you can certainly go to our website, which is granitedadvance.org, or you can use your telephone right now, um, your smartphone to... Uh, digitally scan that using that QR code that you see on the screen. So again, this is our digital copy of our Admissions Insider. Also can get to that from, the, um, from our website as well. So just a little bit about us before we get going on the admissions portion, um, who we are. So Granite Advance is a private nonprofit organization. We're located in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, we've been around for a number of years and we work with students and families through this entire admission process. So you might see us, you know, doing early college planning presentations in an elementary or a middle school, all the way up to students who are graduate students and are looking to um, continue their education and, and get those advanced degrees and everything in between. We provide presentations in the schools or um, through statewide webinars, just as uh, such as this one that you've joined us for this evening. Um, we are available to work one-on-one -on -one with students as well. Um, so families can make appointments with us, with our counselors. We have appointments available Monday through Friday, either virtually through Zoom or in our Concord offices. So whichever is most convenient for you and works out the easiest, you can make those appointments with us. And you see on the screen right now, there is a link there for our Calendly. Calendly is an app that we use to schedule appointments. And when you click on that link, you'll see a calendar and you can choose the date and the time that works best for you for the appointments that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, you can also call us and schedule an appointment online if you would like to or ask any questions that you might have. But some of the appointments that we have range from career and aptitude exploration where students can do an assessment and then work with one of our counselors to go through that assessment and understand you know, what their strengths are, what their aptitudes are, what their interests are, and where do those aptitudes and interests meet in terms of a potential career. And then maybe some colleges that would make sense to be able to visit um, for something like that as well. Um, exploring educational pathways, really that appointment kind of encompasses all things college. So if students are thinking about um, putting together their list of colleges or they are um, trying to figure out which schools might offer the type of financial aid that they're looking for or if they are in the process of um, applying for um, admission and they have questions about the Common App, all of those things would kind of fall under exploring educational pathways if students are unsure which direction they want to head, maybe a two-year, four-year, whatever it may be. Um, that would be an appropriate appointment for, for that student and their family. Financial aid support and facts of prep. This is an appointment to really help families um, who are seniors right now um, through this process, or maybe for families you know that might have younger students as well. But this is where Families can ask those questions before we get started on that FAFSA form um, and, and learn a little bit more about financial aid. They can also join us to create what's called their FSA IDs, and we'll get into some of those things later. Um, FAFSA assistance is really that, um, helping students and families to complete their FAFSA form, and then reviewing financial aid offers will come a little bit later in the process when students have received their offers of financial assistance from their colleges and they'd like to compare those and kind of work through that with one of our counselors. So lots of different appointments available. Um, these will kind of be mo most appropriate at different times of this senior year for our students, but certainly reach out to us and ask any questions that you might have. All right, so let's get started on uh, senior college night. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is building that college list. So students, when you are thinking about this, um, the first thing that you might 
want to think about is doing some research, understanding, you know, what you're looking for. Ask yourself some questions and, you know, through this process, what is it that you're looking for in a school? I think sometimes, you know, because all of your friends are, are in the process of doing the same thing, because parents are involved in the process as well, um, and we're asking a lot of questions of our students, sometimes students lose what they're really looking for. It's really about them as they are seeking out this place that they'll spend the next two to four years of their education. So what do you what are you looking for from that college experience students? What are the things in a college campus that are not negotiable at all? That nothing, you know, this campus, if it doesn't have this thing, I'm not going to go there. It's not going to be the right fit for me. I mean, I would think college major certainly falls under that. Um, we want to make sure that the college has that major that you intend to study. But what are the other things that are non-negotiable in your list? Under which circumstances do you learn best? Are you a student who needs to be learning hands-on? Are you a student who can thrive in a lecture hall with 500 other students and you know maybe not having as much one-on-one -on -one time with your professor? Are you able to learn in that way? Or are you a student that really feels like you would need to have a, you know, a classroom that's a little bit smaller, um, the ability to speak, you know, and interact with your professor a lot more and know them um, and have a better relationship with them. You know, how do you how do you see yourself falling in that spectrum? Um, when you're visiting campuses, can you picture yourself there? You know, can you picture yourself walking around with your backpack amongst all these students and going into the student center and eating in the dining hall, all of those things? And then I think a the thing that we might forget about when we're visiting campus is how do you recharge? How do you, you know, what is that that you need to keep yourself going? Are you a person that needs that total social interaction all the time and needs to be going from activity to activity? Or are you a student that kind of needs to retreat a little bit and spend a little time by yourself and then you're ready for the activity again? Um, is this an environment that's going to allow that for you? Think about some of those things as you're looking um, and researching your college campuses. If you understand what you're looking for, it makes it a lot easier to break down the approximately 4,000 colleges that are in the United States alone. Certainly we don't want students applying to 4,000 colleges, so we need to break that list down. Um, students can research in a number of ways. You can use your school's platform. So if your school uses Naviant or Score or Zello, these are places that students can really do some college searching. And then it's nice because that will be saved on that platform for you. And you can continue the research at a different time or, or then add those to your list of colleges you want to apply to. Um, but for students that don't have, you know, one of those platforms in their school, Big Future is a really good place that's on the College Board website, or using Peterson's is another really great place to do some college searching and creating a profile for yourself and keeping that list and working on that as you go through. So for our seniors, this is something that you're probably right in the process of doing right now is creating this list of colleges and finalizing that list of colleges so you can get those applications going. Other things that you might want to consider as you're looking at schools and, and taking this all in, obviously your career goals are going to be really important. I think we talk about location of the school quite a bit with students. You know, do you want to be in the city? Do you want to be more in a rural environment, which makes the most sense to you? And I think, you know, it, that's a matter of preference sometimes for students, but also think about that in terms of your career. You know, if you want to be you're a theater major and you want to be acting at some point in time, going to school in, you know, the most northern most regions of our, you know, of our state per, per se, might not be the place that you're going to have access to those theaters to be able to perform, or at least not those larger theaters. So thinking about that in terms of your career goal, are there going to be internships available? Are there going to be opportunities available for you? Um, is something that you want to consider as well as what do you like and what do you prefer? If you're an undecided major, that's okay. I think a lot of times we get very nervous about, um, and by we, maybe parents more than students, um, we get very nervous about if they don't have a major selected, are they going to lose time? Are we going to lose money? What's going to happen, you know, as they go off to this four-year school? In most cases, when you're applying as an undecided major, 
Um, you have plenty of time to make that choice. Usually students don't need to declare their major into um, until their sophomore year of college, sometimes even the end of their sophomore year of college. And there are so many courses that, you know, they're going to take as part of that core curriculum that may spark that interest in a particular area. And it gives them room in their electives to take some courses in the areas that they might think might be of interest and then declare that major. So they're not wasting their time. They're not wasting money. They're making, um, you know, making a pathway towards that ultimate major. In terms of admission, I think it's hard because I think sometimes students feel like, if they are undecided, that's going to hurt them in the admission process. And it really doesn't hurt you in the admission process. College admission counselors realize that part of going to college is that growth, is being able to explore and maybe learn about different careers that you've never even heard of before. So we expect there to be some changes in terms of, you know, Maybe the student comes in as a particular major, as an undecided major, and declares a major in a different area as they go through. So that does not impact um, an admission decision. There are definitely exceptions. You know, if you're looking to go into a direct admit nursing program or something in the health sciences, often engineering, those are things that you might need to decide a little bit more ahead of time because those courses kind of follow each other all four of those years through. And in order to complete that process in time, you know, you may find that you need to go directly in as a freshman in those particular majors. Accessibility services and academic support are something that um, students should be exploring at this point in time um, in the admission process. Academic support is for everyone. So whether you are, you know, a straight A student in high school or, or you're not a straight A student in high school, you may find that in college, it is helpful to seek academic support. It's generally part of your tuition, so it's right there for you. So it does make sense to go ahead and utilize those services. And usually colleges have everything from, you know, those individual to group tutoring sessions that you can go to. So if math is not your thing, but it is required for admission, you can go through and, you know, find a tutor in that area to help you through or um, maybe even a writing center on campus where you know, you're know you a freshman and this is your first English course or your first history course and you're writing your paper, you can go to that writing center and usually they're staffed by upperclassmen who have taken these courses or perhaps by even by a faculty member. And they can give you tips on your writing style. Maybe you're lucky enough to get somebody that had that same professor you have and can say, you know what, they really require you to be very strict on that MLA process. So you really want to make sure you have these quotations right or whatever it may be. They might be able to give you some pointers and help you um, through that first writing um, on your campus as well. And then for students who have an IEP or a 504 in place in high school, you'll want to think about meeting with the um, Accessibility Services Office on the campus. While IEPs and 504s are not exactly how they operate in college, those kind of go away, they disappear after high school, colleges can offer accommodations to students that need them. You go through a process, you meet with them, and, and they will look at all the paperwork that you have. Um, generally, they like paperwork um, that is within three years, um, and they'll look at that information, and they'll sit down with the student, and they will talk through the different accommodations that might be available to them and what's going to work. Sometimes they even suggest things that maybe weren't even in your IEP or 504 that might help you at the college level, and they can help you to put those in place for your experience on the campus. Um, also, if student has um, specific food needs or housing needs, these are the folks that you want to talk to and they will help you to get those accommodations in place. So think about those things as you're visiting campuses, as you're looking at schools. Um, it's great to make sure there's strong academic supports and strong um, uh, supports for students with any type of disability. So now is a time where you're really getting to know these schools and it's as important as you're trying to narrow down that list. I don't know if any of the students that are listening in with us tonight have you know, a list of 20 schools or a big list of schools that you're trying to kind of narrow down before you apply. But some of the ways that you can, can maybe do that is to attend college fairs or go to the high school visits um, at your high school. So 
Many of you have been to college fairs where you walk around from table to table and you visit with the different college representatives. Um, and many of you know that at your high school, um, college reps come to visit with students there as well. Usually you can get a pass from your school counselor and go down to visit with that representative when they come to your school. This is a really good time to interact with that admissions rep. That admission rep that is at that college fair or is at your high school visit is very likely the admission rep that is going to be the first, at least initial reader of your college application. College admission officers travel in territories. So, you know, the the rep from New Hampshire will be coming to your school and they will be the first one to touch that file when your student applies. So it's really great idea to get to meet them, for them to meet you and to have a little bit of an interaction so that you feel really comfortable asking questions throughout the process um, because they do come up and, and this is the person that you can ask. So when you are visiting with them, you know, take the time to ask those questions, ask thoughtful questions, you know, um, maybe not things that you can find very easily on the internet, but things that, you know, that would really help you to get to know the campus more. I like asking um, college reps even now, you know, when I get to interact with them, what is the culture like on your campus? What's your favorite tradition that students and maybe faculty participate on the campus? You get a better sense of what they're all about when you get some of those answers um, as you, you know, make your way through the process. These reps will also have, um, interest cards that they'll either bring with them or they might have a QR code where you scan and you fill out the card electronically. Fill those out because that does show the college that you are interested. It also lets the rep remember that they met with you at your at your high school or maybe at a college fair so that when your application comes in, they can you know recall that information and the discussions that you may have had. Um, but it puts you also on that school school's mailing list. I will tell you, definitely you'll get more mail um, for sure if you're not already getting plenty. But it is good to get that mail from the schools that you are most interested in because, you know, they may send you an invitation to an open house. Um, they may send you information about the particular major that you're interested in. They may send things about club interests. So it's nice to get all of those pieces, not just one um, from those schools of interest for sure. And then open houses for high school seniors are a great opportunity to get onto these campuses and really learn a lot in a pretty short amount of time about the school. A visit, you know, when you visit the campus and you have an information session and a tour, those are great visits as well, where, you know, the admissions counselors are going to talk about the campus and then they're going to send you off on tour with a student. And then you get that, you know, that small or, or definitely, you know, sometimes larger tours depending on the campus. But that's where you get to ask some of your questions. Open house, usually there are tours offered as well, but there's usually also faculty available to, for you to speak with. There's sometimes like an interest fair that you can kind of walk around and talk to different organizations on campus and learn more information about those. Sometimes they even have time that you can kind of explore on your own. Maybe go hear financial aid talk, or you can go on a tour of the residence halls, or you can, you know, there's different things. You maybe eat lunch in the dining hall. So open houses are just a little bit amped up from those information session and tours. So you get a little bit more information. It's a little bit more of a fanfare um, for the students at those open houses, but a great opportunity to visit a college campus for sure. And then also you want to um, think about, students should really think about following the college on social media. They learn an awful lot this way about the school, you know, follow everything that you're interested in, you know, follow the college itself, follow the admissions office, follow the clubs that you might be interested in, you know, maybe follow the athletics, you know, the sports that you're interested in, uh, your area of study, you know, do the, does your major have a, a page? So follow all of the things that you might be interested in and get a real sense of, you know, what they're putting up on social media and, what the campus might be like a little bit more. So I think, you know, getting to know the campus is really important as, as much as you can. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to visit them all before you apply. I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to get to all of the campuses you're interested in, but for those you can, that's great. You can also apply to the schools and once you're accepted, you can go visit later for an accepted students day or, a, or an information session and tour later in the process. I do tell students notice when you are on campus, um, on the walls, there's all kinds of different flyers. There's bulletin boards in the residence halls, in the student center, there's usually bulletin boards or posters up about, 
you know, maybe the play that the, you know, the musical or the play that they're putting on the, you know, if there's Greek life on campus, you'll definitely see Greek flyers about Greek week or rushing or whatever it may be. Um, if there's um, political candidates coming to the campus to speak to students, that might be up on the, the walls or the bulletin boards. If there's comedians or whatever it may be, you'll get a sense, you know, by looking at what that campus who they're bringing in, again, as to the culture of the campus. So notice all those things and, and pick up a student newspaper if those are around in the campus center, um, just to get a sense of what that campus is about a little bit more. So college fairs, I did mention um, just a minute ago, there um, is a great college fair coming up actually really soon at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, this is what they call the NEAC Act, the New England Association of College Admission Counselors College Fair. And these are rather large. Um, they're very active. There's a lot of students and families that will be there. Um, but this is a great opportunity to visit with a lot of colleges in a short amount of time. Um, get those cards signed up, you know, get your questions answered by those admission reps. Again, September 24th uh, at Southern New Hampshire University from 9 to 11 a.m. They're going to be there. Some of the local high schools will be busing students to Southern New Hampshire University. So check with your school counselor to see if that is an opportunity for you. Um, some schools will also allow an excused absence for visiting a college fair such as this. So again, just communicating with your school counselor what might be offered for your particular high school. But this is a great opportunity for students to, um, to really visit a lot of different colleges. So once you have visited some schools and have a really good idea of which ones make the most sense for you, they fit, you know, kind of what you're looking for, then you're really going to start kind of finalizing that list of colleges. And when you do that, I want students to really think about a balanced list of schools. You want to make sure that on that list, you have some schools that are going to be more likely to admit you. And some, you know, schools that are really maybe a reach school, a school that you don't quite hit all of their stats, but you would love to apply and see if perhaps that's, you know, a school that might work for you. Um, but again, you want to mix it up. You want to have some schools that maybe are in-state schools, some schools that are out-of-state schools, maybe some public schools, some private schools on the list so that you have different types of admission processes in there, but also different offerings in terms of financial aid and hold that box. I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. But balancing this list gives students the best shot at having um, the best admission process and then the best offerings for financial aid as well. I tell students when they come to me with a list of colleges, if they, can't tell me two to three things or two to three really specific reasons that they're applying to us to one of the schools on their list that it's probably not a school that they need to be applying to you know if it's a school that you just threw in there because you've got a free application fee and you want to see if you get in honestly that's nice but it's it's a situation where there's a lot of steps in this process and when you start muddying those steps with a lot of schools that you have to keep track of the particular school portal and all of the emails and all of the correspondence, it just becomes a little bit much for some students. So make sure that there's two to three very specific reasons why you're applying to that college and you know enough about it that you can name those reasons as well. So balanced approach to your list Obviously, we want students to be thinking about their major as they're applying to schools. Does this school have your major? Um, obviously, that's not going to be a great thing if the school does not have your major because, you know, that's why you're going to college. So think about your major. And if you're undecided, you know, think about some of the things you may be interested in and see that the college has a couple of those things. Um, then that will be a good school to add to your list as well. And then the last thing, and this is the thing that I very much stress with students and families when putting together their list of colleges is really consider how financial aid is offered at the school. We're not going to talk a lot about financial aid tonight, but this is one of those things that I do want you to understand right now. Financial aid nights are going to be happening at your schools very, very soon. If they, you know, are not happening this week, they're going to be happening within the next month or so at your school. So we'll talk a lot about that then. But what I do want you to know about financial aid now is that colleges themselves um, have their own pool of money that they're able to offer to students. So federal student aid, 
that comes through the FAFSA process. And that's something that is driven by that form and what our numbers are. But the schools themselves have this pool of money. And some schools have a really large pool and some it's not quite as big. But that, those schools determine how they're offering their aid. So are they offering their aid to student based on family needs? So based on the FAFSA numbers, are they going to be offering money to the students that way? Or are they going to be offering students aid based on merit? So based on their grades and their test scores, if that's something that they require. Some schools do both. Some do only one or the other. So if you know as a student, you fall into the category of needing that merit-based aid because you may not qualify for need-based aid, then you want to make sure that you're applying to colleges that offer merit-based aid. So if you're only applying to Ivy League colleges, you're not going to get any merit aid because those colleges don't offer it. So be careful about your list of schools. Not only do you want to balance it with in-state, out-of-state, public-private, but you also want to make sure that these schools are going to be offering the aid that you're looking for. So you can be the number one valedictorian of your senior class, and if you apply to only schools that offer need-based aid and you don't qualify, you're not going to get that merit aid because they're not offering it. So just really think about that as you're putting together your list of schools. Lauren, do we have questions that I should be answering for you? Let me take so far, so good. Awesome. Asked, the only one that came in, someone asked, what exactly is merit-based aid? That's an awesome question. Thank you for asking. Um, so merit-based aid is based on something that the student has done well. Most often, that's their academics. So it's their grades, their test scores, if the college requires SATs or ACTs. Um, sometimes the rigor of their courses is going to be you know, weighed into that formula as well. Um, so most often that's what we're seeing is academic merit scholarship offered from the colleges. And you'll see that typically when a student receives their um, admission. So when they are accepted to college, a lot of times the colleges will put the academic merit scholarship right in that letter um, to let students know. Sometimes it's a little bit later than that, but often it is with that acceptance letter. Sometimes merit aid could be based on at things like athletics. So some of our students that are gonna be playing maybe a division one or a division two um, sport in college may find that they receive athletic merit scholarship. And that's something that, you know, will come through that athletic program, you know, whether it's soccer or it's football or it's field hockey, whatever that may be, that's gonna come to them through that program. Um, sometimes the merit comes from um, a situation where a student needs to do an audition. So for students that are going into like um, performing arts, like theater or dance or music, they will go and do an audition at the school, or sometimes they can actually um, submit their auditions um, digitally to the school. And based on that audition, they may receive some merit-based aid as well. So that is really nice for those students. Um, they might also get it for um, a portfolio. So for our art students or students that might be going into architecture, a lot of times they have to submit a portfolio of their work. And based on that portfolio, sometimes students will receive merit aid as well. And then we see merit aid, you know, in other ways too, like sometimes for leadership and sometimes for community service. But those are the biggies that we're going to see coming from the colleges themselves. Hopefully that makes sense. Lauren, other questions? Yep. I think for your next slide, this one will probably fit best at Perfect. the start of this. So kind of a more general financial aid question. The person asked, do you need a social security number to fill out the FAFSA form? Great question. So you don't need a social security number to fill out the FAFSA. Um, it does make the process easier, but for students or parents who don't have a social security number, there is a process that you go through um, to file the FAFSA form. So no, students do not need to have um, the social security form. Students do need to be American citizens or qualified non you know, eligible non-citizens in order to qualify for federal aid, but they don't need to have that in place, the social security in place. Great question. So one of the questions that I often get asked, because of course, this is my big thing. I always want to tell families, you know, really think about how these colleges are offering their aid because we see families on the other end who didn't receive as much aid as they were kind of hoping for. And just unfortunately, it was the schools that the students applied to either didn't have really large merit aid or really large need-based aid 
or they didn't have the kind that made that families were looking for. So how do we know, you know, what's going to be looked at? Go to the college's website, go to their financial aid website and look at that page. And if there's a bunch of scholarships listed, the presidential scholarship, the, you know, the dean scholarship, the trustee scholarship, the Mary blah, 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 blah scholarship, then we know that the college does have that, you know, there. Um you know, need-based aid, most of the schools will have some of that, but a way to figure out like where you may fall in this process is to use what's called a net price calculator. This is something that's available on each college's website. They are required to have these. Um, typically they're on the financial aid page of the website. Um, sometimes it's trickier to find. So, you know, you can always use that search function within that college website to just put net price calculator and you'll find that. But these calculators, you provide financial information, things like adjusted gross income, um, how many members of your family, those types of questions, asset questions are going to be in there. And then based on the numbers that you provide, the calculator will provide you with what is considered a net price. So net price is what you would pay at that college after scholarships, you know, those merit-based scholarships and grants have been put into place. So merit and need-based scholarships and grants, I'm sorry, have been put into place. So instead of the sticker price that you find on the college's website, you're going to actually pay this net price that the calculators are showing you. They're, you know, relatively accurate. Um, you do have to be a little bit careful about making sure they're up to date um, and that, you know, they're not using information from 2021, for example, that they're using, you know, closer information, maybe from 2023 prices. Um, but this is a great way to really get some sense of what an offer of aid would look like for your student at that particular institution. And you can run them for each institution and get a sense of, you know, is this one that we think we can possibly afford? Then it makes sense to be, you know, on the list of colleges. If this is a college that, you know, is it has a eighty thousand um, dollar sticker price, and it looks like we're going to pay a seventy five thousand dollar debt price. Then maybe it's not as you know as probable that that student is going to get what they need at that particular institution. But these are very helpful. Um, they are an estimate for sure, but it does give you something to kind of go off um, when you're getting started in this process for sure. You still need to file all of the financial aid paperwork, so the FAFSA and any other required um, financial aid forms. This is not a guarantee, it's just an estimate. Um, but again, gives you some sense of where we are in this process um, at this point in time. So net price calculators can be very helpful. So once students get this list all together and they you know, break it down to the number of colleges that they feel very comfortable um, applying to, then it's time to get those applications ready to go. So there are multiple ways that students can apply to college these days. Um, multiple decision processes. Some colleges may have several of these available to students and some colleges may only have a couple. Um, but let's kind of go through the different ways that our students could apply to college and, and what they might mean. So the first one that you see up there is early decision. This is the most restrictive of all the different ways that you can apply to school. When students apply early decision, they fill out their applications early. Typically, those are somewhere between October 1 and December-ish. Um, some colleges will have an early decision one deadline, and then they'll also have an early decision two deadline, which might be more into January. Um, but for the most part, you know, those first ED1s are going to be in the fall earlier. Students will apply early. They'll also hear back from the college early about their admission status. And then with early decision, because it's a binding decision, once they have received that acceptance, they are to withdraw all of their other applications that they have out there. And this is the college that they will be attending. So that's what an early decision means, is that it is this decision, it is binding the student the parent and a school counselor sign the contract. <laughs> the only way this would be non-binding is if for some reason the financial aid 
did not come through similar to what the net price calculator has offered to the student. So you want to run net price calculators if you're even thinking about early decision and get an idea of can you afford this college? Because if you can't, it's not wise to apply early decision because likely it's not going to be affordable and then the student will end up having to withdraw. So we don't want them to have to do that. We don't want, you know, hearts to be broken. It's a hard process for sure. So early decision is really not for everyone. It's really for students that are very set that this is the school that they want to attend really early in the process. They need to know this and that financially it is going to be somewhat affordable for that family. Lauren, was there a question? Yep. So the student asked, are you allowed to apply to one school ED1? And then if you don't get in, apply to another school for ED2. Great question. And that's kind of where this came into play um, is that, yes, typically if you are not admitted ED1 to a particular school, you will usually have enough time to apply ED2 to that second school. So Yes, for the most part, I can't answer that it's going to be a guarantee with, you know, deadlines for each school and when they get that answer out to you. But that's the idea is that that is in place. I think a lot of schools admit a big portion, a lot of really competitive schools admit a bigger portion of their class ED. So they put in this ED1 and ED2 because so many students apply in that process. So they also broke up the admission process for them to be able to read it fast enough to get answers out to students as well. But yes, in theory, you should be able to do that, but just kind of check on deadlines um, and check with the school, you know, that's your ED1 to see when those um, decisions will come out so that you have time to do that. Great question. And then just a quick clarifying question. Someone else asked, <laughs> what does ED1 and ED2 mean? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. So ED1 and ED2 are different deadlines for students. So ED1 will usually be in that earlier bracket, somewhere in that October to maybe early December-ish bracket. And then ED2, if they have a second early decision date, it will generally be a little bit later than that. So it would be maybe January, maybe February of that year. So ED1 would be their first pool, ED2 would be that school's second pool. Not every college does that. Not every college even has early decision. Some do, some don't. Um, some may only have just early decision. They don't even call it ED1 or two. It's just early decision. You have to have everything in by November 1, and that's what we do. Um, but other schools do have that second pool of early decision, and they'll give a second deadline for that second pool. Great questions. So that's early decision. Similarly, early action, or EA as they say, um, early action is that same process of applying early and hearing back from the schools early. You are just not bound to that school. So it's a non-binding decision. So you can hear back and you can apply to several schools, early action. You can hear back from them, get your answer, you know, sometimes even by the holidays, you know, sometimes even by mid-December students are hearing, sometimes even earlier um, from these early action schools. But you have all the way until May 1st, which is that national candidate reply date to make your final decision. So early action is for probably the process that more of our students are going to be looking at rather than early decision where we can only apply to one college early decision. You can't apply to multiple colleges because you can't be bound to multiple colleges. Early action, you can apply to multiple colleges and you can apply early action to some of your schools, even though you have applied early decision to one college, you can apply early action to other schools. And if for some reason, you know, you're not admitted to that early decision college, then you have your early action schools in line as well. So early action is a little bit more flexible in that sense. Some schools, again, put in an early action one and an early action two, um, but most just kind of have an early action deadline, which usually happens sometime, sometimes as early as October, but we're usually seeing like November 1 to probably December 15th-ish um, for the early action deadlines. This is a great way for students to apply if they're kind of on the ball, they have everything ready to rock and roll by those dates, and you're a strong candidate in that pool. So if a student, um, you know, knows that this is a school where, you know, they're looking for students with a particular grade point average and particular test scores, if you kind of fall somewhere around that, it's probably a good school to apply early action. But if a school is a little bit 
or one that you might not quite fall into that category. Um, and you know that the classes that you're taking in your senior year are challenging courses and they're going to look great on your transcript and that you're doing really well in them. And that would help you to be admitted to these schools. Then you might want to look at regular decision. Regular decision happens a little bit later in the process, usually sometime between November, but more often like January to March um, are the regular decision deadlines. And some students would benefit from those deadlines either because they just don't have all of their materials together, which is fine, or because those first semester senior grades are really going to help you to look great in that applicant pool, then look at regular decision. So regular decision, many colleges have early action and regular decision. Some will have early decision and regular decision. So just look for those different options when you're reviewing those at the college websites. But regular decision works very nicely for a lot of our students as well. Rolling admission is a little bit different. So some schools already are accepting students at this point in time. So they opened August 1st when the Common App opened, they're, they were accepting applications. And some schools are already reviewing those applications and they will continue to review applications until their class is filled. Other schools with rolling admission haven't started to review yet, but they operate on a rolling admission basis. So first come, first served. So you have your application in nice and early. It gets reviewed by the admission committee. You are admissible. You're going to hear back from them. You're all set. That's your, you know, you have that spot, non-binding spot in the class, and you make your decision by May 1. Um, other schools are going to fill very quickly. Sometimes rolling admission schools fill very quickly their class, and you can be the best student in the whole wide world, like a, a very, very qualified candidate, but they just don't have a spot left in their class. So just kind of get a sense of when that class fills up. Um, you can certainly ask that question of an admission counselor. That's a very wise question to ask, you know, when they're at your high school or when you're at a college fair or even send them an email. Um, find out when generally does their freshman class fill and make sure that you have your application in way before that so that you get reviewed um, and have that spot reserved for you should you choose to take that. And then there's a process called direct admission and we're seeing this more and more. Um, you'll notice that um, you know some of our state schools are keen, uh, Plymouth UNH are gonna be looking at direct admission for students um, where this kind of simplifies the admission process for students. If you are using um, the Common Application, the Common App, um, these schools are able to know that you've applied and they can, based on specific criteria for students, if you are admissible to their class, even if you haven't applied to that particular school, you may get an acceptance from that school um, to let you know that you have a spot in their class should you choose to take that spot. It kind of opens up the door to some schools that you may not have thought about. Um, it also would be nice to know, like, you know, what their financial aid might look like, you know, so you may want to, you know, in the process of applying for financial aid, include those schools that maybe you were offered a direct admit um, position and see, you know, what that financial aid might look like for the student as well. And some of them may not be schools that you're interested in, but certainly there are many that might be. So just kind of watch for that throughout this cycle. We definitely saw more direct admit students last year, and I think we're going to see more, um, even more than that this year. So just know that that is a possibility out there, and you may see that as well. So lots of different ways to apply to college and what works the best for the student is the way they should apply. And this is a discussion they can have with their um, school counselors. If they would like to speak with one of us about this, they are most welcome to do that. And this strategy may be at yeah, this school I'm applying early action and at this school I'm applying regular decision because that's going to be best for me in those applicant pools. So um, just to give you an idea of what there is available out there for sure. And then once students are really getting down to the business of applying to colleges, there are um, some different ways that they can apply. So one of the ways is using the common application. This is most frequent, 
what students are doing is using what's called the common application where they can go online, they create kind of their base application, which has all of their demographic information, their self-reported grades, the classes that they took, you know, so some of the information that all colleges are going to be looking for, and then they will add their specific colleges and those colleges will have sections that the student will also need to complete. Usually things like, you know, are you coming in for the fall semester or the spring semester? Are you applying full-time, part-time? What major are you applying to? Those types of things. But some of them may also have supplemental um, essays or information that they want from the student. But this Common App enables students to use this one application to apply to multiple colleges. So it has made things certainly much easier for students um, than it was years past, for sure. Certainly when um, parents... Uh, if any of you are closer to my age, when we went to school, we did not have this option for sure. So more than 1,000 colleges participate in the common application. So chances are pretty good that a good portion of your students' colleges do participate. Sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes they have their own specific application that students can complete, and that is an option for students. Um, the coalition application is another application that they can complete as well. Um, that's about 150 schools that use that one. Um, Typically, those are schools that have agreed to review students in a holistic approach where they look at not just grades and test scores, but they look at the essay, they look at the student as a whole, they read letters of recommendation, all of those pieces. Um, but they students can use whichever method they wish to apply as long as the student, you know, the college will accept that. And the colleges do not have a preference one way or another. So if they're a common app school, but they also have their own application, it doesn't matter which one the student uses. There's no preference in terms of reading those applications for admission. Nobody gets the leg up. Um, whichever way it works for the students is just fine. Um, but when they are using, or, you know, just getting this application together, there are pieces that are going to need to accompany this application. And one of those is the high school transcript. So this is something that will come directly from your high school. So students cannot just send a copy of their high school transcript that won't be accepted. Um, this comes directly from your high school. And there will be a way that your particular high school sends this either if you're a Naviance or score school, that's going to be sent through those programs, you know, so you will be taught how to make the common app and Naviance speak to one another. And then your school counselors will be able to send high school transcripts directly through the common app to, or directly through Naviance to your schools. But that high school transcript is really a very important part of this process. And it, I would say, you know, I've worked at three or four different colleges and each time I would read an admission file, that's the first thing I would pull out because obviously we want the student to be academically successful on the college campus and that high school transcript it is a four year picture of how that student has done over time and just gives a sense of what level coursework they've taken, have they challenged themselves appropriately, um, what coursework do they seem to prefer, that all of that information is going to be there on that transcript. The other thing that students are going to need to do is complete the college essay. So on the Common App, there are seven prompts they can choose from. Um, all of them having some way, shape, or form relating back to the student. So that essay is always about the student um, to be able to tell more about themselves. This is the piece of the of the application that Lauren always says, you know, like this is the way she gets to know the student a little bit when she was reviewing applications, when she was an admission counselor. Um, this is how you get to know the student. This is your chance to, as a student, let admissions know what you want them to know about you. So choose wisely, you know, choose that topic wisely and make sure that you are um, presenting your best self to the admissions office. Extracurricular activities are important in this process. And it's not how many you did and it's not specific necessarily activities that you did, but it's that you did something, you know, outside of school, you were able to get these great grades in addition to doing these activities, which took up your time as well. So you have time management skills. So when you get to college, when you have that downtime, we feel like maybe you're going to get involved and you're going to be able to balance that work at a collegiate level as well. Um, but certainly, you know, they want to see some of the things that you love, that you're passionate about. When you're adding extracurricular activities to the Common App, there are 10 spaces for you to do that. 
list them in order of your preference. Like if you are just crazy about soccer and you play soccer and you play club soccer and you referee soccer games and you coach little kids, those are the, those are your passionate things. So you want to put those things towards the top of your list of common app activities. Um, you can list sports, you can list clubs, you can list musical activities, you can list work. So really impressive when students have a job, you know, right? That's a big responsibility. You have to show up on time and perform your duties or you no longer have a job. So those are really great things to show to an admission office. If you are not able to be involved in so many activities because you have family responsibilities, maybe it's your job as the eldest sibling to get the younger student, your younger siblings off the bus and get homework started with them. Maybe you have to get dinner started before your parents arrive home, or maybe you're the shuttle bus and you drive all those younger siblings to their practices and whatever it may be. That shows an incredible amount of responsibility as well. So whatever it is you're doing, Make sure you're listing all of those things on that extracurricular activity section of the common application. Use that space wisely. You only have 150 characters to describe what you're doing. So just use that space wisely and emphasize action words and things that you have contributed to those activities. That's what you want admissions to know about you. Letters of recommendation are another piece that students are going to include. So some colleges are um, going to ask for specific letters of recommendation. A lot of schools, all the schools for the most part are gonna ask for a school counselor letter of recommendation and your counselor will be writing that for you. And that's something that they will um, attach through, again, through Naviance or through the Common App, whatever it may be that they're using at your school, um, those letters of recommendation. And they do what's called a school report as well. But you wanna have other letters of recommendation available as well, because some colleges will say that they want one teacher recommendation or two teachers a recommendation, or some colleges will allow you to include optional letters of recommendation. So you include what you want to include in the, those letters of recommendation. So usually we recommend that students have that counselor letter ready to go as well as two letters of recommendation from teachers. Great idea to have a teacher in the area of study that you want to pursue in college. If you can, if you don't have anybody that can do a good job of that, then just make sure you find teachers that know you well, that can speak to your um, academic abilities, that can speak to you as a student, you know, there at the high school. How do you, do you come prepared to class? Do you engage in conversations? Do you do particularly well in project work, whatever it may be? And that's what those counselors are, that those teachers are going to talk about. Your school counselor is going to write about you kind of more as a citizen of your high school. So they're going to talk maybe a little bit about academics, but probably more about you at, and how you get involved in your community at the high school, maybe how you're involved in the community outside your high school, if they know that information about you. Um, I would ask, you know, would tell you to provide these recommenders with information about yourself so that they're able to kind of reference it as they write those letters of recommendation. Because typically teachers and counselors are writing quite a few. So if they, you know, it's easier to write if you have a little bit of information about the student right in, in front of you as you write those letters of recommendation. They may ask you to complete a brag sheet. They may ask you to complete a survey, whatever it may be, to kind of help them write those. But letters of recommendation are definitely very important in the admission process, so choose your teachers wisely. SAT or ACT scores. So some colleges still require test scores from students across the board. Some colleges just require test scores from students for certain majors, you know, maybe for nursing or for engineering or for physical therapy, whatever it may be. Um, and then other colleges offer that you, an optional test score policy where you decide whether you want to submit your test scores or not. Um, typically, you know, students will ask, well, how do I know if I should submit them or not? See if you can find either on their website or if you use Naviance in the schools, you can see on, um, on your own pages, like where that school's mid 50% of test scores fall. If you're within that mid 50% range, um, then it's a good idea to submit your scores. If you are above that mid 50% range, 
you definitely want to submit your scores. But if you're below that, you may not want to submit your scores. So if you're in that lower 25% of scores for that particular institution, that may not be one that you want to submit those scores. Um, some colleges will require, even though they're test optional, they require you to submit test scores for merit scholarship. So just be aware of that as you're going through that process because you don't want to miss out on merit scholarship because you're like, oh, I'm a little nervous about my task scores. Um, typically, it's a good, you know, obviously it's a good idea to submit those scores if the college is requiring those for merit scholarship. Um, but SAT and ACT scores are something that, you know, you may find yourself needing to make a decision about. I would caution you that if you add those to your Common App, if you add, you self-report SAT or ACT scores on the Common App, but you're hoping to apply test optional to a particular school, get them out of there before you send them to the college, because once they have them, they have them, um, you know, whether they're self-reported or they're from the college board. So just be aware of that. Be cautious about that. But, um, you know, if it is test optional, it is it is optional. And then there are schools that won't look at test scores at all. Those are um test blind schools where they will not consider your scores. Even if you have a perfect 1600 and you want to report those, they're not going to use that as part of their admission policies. So um, just look at the college websites and figure out how, you know, are they requiring scores? Is it test optional? Is it test blind? And then you can make that um, decision if you need, if need be. Talk to counselors, talk to, you know, folks at the admission office if you have questions about that. Additional things to consider. Um, again, we talked about auditions and portfolios. Some of our students are going to need to do those, um, you know, if in the performing arts or the fine arts areas. Some of our students are going to want to be student athletes, and particularly if they want to play at a Division I or Division II level, they're going to need to complete the NCAA Eligibility Center forms online. That's something that they want to go through and, and complete. Um, coaches can't talk with students unless they've completed that. For Division Three athletes, if you're not really sure, um, or you're going to play Division Three, Division Three students don't have to have a profile with the Eligibility Center, but you can. Um, I think if you're unsure if you're playing two or three, or which level you might um, be looking at, then I would create a profile with um, NCAA Eligibility Center. And then some colleges do have supplemental essays. You'll see these um, either on the Common App in the in the section that is specific to the school, or if you're completing their own applications online, those will be available in that application online. Um, but just figure out, you know, do they require these, and leave yourself enough time to complete them, um, because if they require them, you have to complete them. But a lot will say they're optional. Never, I, I. I would advise that they're not really optional. I would complete them, um, you know, in terms of that admission process. It just looks better. Um, this is your opportunity to tell this college a little bit more about yourself. So take that opportunity to do so and complete those supplemental essays. But leave yourself enough time to make sure you have time to do a good job with those. So one of the things that we like to talk about here at Granted Advance a lot is the fact that in this process, students really need to start taking the lead. Um, and by this, I mean, students, you are the ones that should be contacting admission offices. You should email those representatives or you should be the one doing the talking at the college fair. Um, you're the one that's going to college. Um, you're the one that's gonna be on that campus. So at this point in time, admission offices and, and the various offices on campus really want to speak to the student. They don't so much wanna speak to us as parents. They will, they absolutely will. Um, and they wanna answer our questions as parents, but really they wanna engage with the student as much as possible. So make sure students, you're the ones that, you know, sign up for the tours and that you are emailing or speaking with the counselors. There's nothing worse than um, I read admission files for a college in Boston. And in that file, I can see the notes that come from the folks that are, you know, handling the, the calls that are coming in. And it will say, mom called to check on the student's status. Mom called again to check on the student's status. Mom called to see, you know, when they're going to hear back from the admissions office. And that's not a really great look for the student. It's much more important that we see that 
Lauren called and asked on about her status as a student and if she's missing anything in the process. Um, that shows that initiative on the part of the student and the fact that they're taking control of this process. So we don't want to see mom or dad. We, we really want to talk with the students at this point in time. Um, students also make sure that you're using your social media appropriately at this point in time because colleges can check on that. Um, if you have a lot of things up there that probably aren't giving off the true or great impression of you, then you might want to wipe some of those things at this point in time. Um, just be cautious about that because, you know, that is something that not only colleges can check, but employers can check as well. So just know that that's something to be thinking about. Um, I would encourage students to also create a new um, kind of professional email account that they use for college. So your name at gmail.com is generally sufficient because then it's very easy to identify that Lauren Broderick is contacting me and I want to make sure that I get back to her as one of the students in my, you know, in my territory. I want to make sure that I'm responding to Lauren Broderick and I know immediately who she is. She's not biker chick 26 or, you know, ski bum 97. She is Lauren Broderick. So make sure that, you know, you create an account that is just for college and this will make it a lot easier also because it's not gonna be mixed in with all of your other emails. Um, it'll make it easier for students to be able to find those emails that are coming in from college and to respond quickly and appropriately to those emails that are coming in um, and pay attention to that. <laughs> Honestly, I will say that most of the time the students do have pretty good, strong emails. It's us parents that might have the ones that aren't quite as um, professional or appropriate in the process because we've had them for a hundred years and we're still using that same email. Um, so parents, you know, we can, we can work on that too. Um, stay in communication, you know, parent, students with your parents and with your school counselors and with, um, the admission counselors, the financial aid folks, as you make your way through this process, as I was saying earlier, it is, there is a lot, a lot of steps, a lot of moving parts in this process. And if everybody's on the same page, it makes it really so much smoother and so much easier, you know, have conversations with your parents about financial expectations, you know, what does it look like for us in terms of, you know, maybe parents are able to do this for the student and the student is expected to do this in the process. So have those conversations or parents, I'm thinking that maybe I don't want to be an elementary school teacher, maybe I actually want to be whatever, you know, have those conversations along the way um, so that everybody's on the same page um, as you move through this process for sure. And then students, it's so important that you stay organized. However, that is doesn't really matter as long as you know what you're doing, you know, whether that's a spreadsheet that has all the names of the colleges and all the application deadlines and all the financial aid deadlines and all the pieces that you're required to submit for them. And um, do they have supplemental essays? And when is their deadline? All the things, whether you do that in a spreadsheet, whether it's something you keep on your phone, whether you use the common app for, for a lot of that, whatever is your way of doing this, that's great. But just make sure you are staying super organized. There will be a lot of emails. You will be checking your portals for each college that they that you need to create. You have to stay on top of that because you could miss things. I've seen students, unfortunately, miss information in their portal from the financial aid office, and then they don't provide the information that they needed in order to process aid on time. And we don't want that to happen to any of our students. So really stay on top of it. It is a lot, but you can definitely do it as long as you stay organized in whatever way works best for you. So last thing, a couple of helpful hints as we, you know, kind of wrap up for the evening and we'll make sure that we take some questions if there are some more. But one of the things that, you know, I try to emphasize with students as much as possible is start this process as early as you can, um, really getting these applications completed and finalizing that list. Because your senior year gets busier and busier, um, if you're a student athlete, especially a fall, you know, student athlete, or if you are involved in some clubs and, you know, maybe you're the organizer or you're the president of the clubs or whatever it may be, it gets busy. Your work gets busy. Your homework gets busy. The earlier you start, the more time you have to make things complete, the more time you have to go back and check all of your work, the more time you have to reach out to those people that would be most appropriate to write your letters of recommendation. Time is really important in this process. So really take advantage of that and use that. 
you know, in this process. So it's great that you're here tonight. Great that you're listening in. We're early in the process. You have plenty of time to get everything together, but use that time. Don't procrastinate because then it gets more and more stressful as those deadlines approach. Organizing, as I was just saying, this is really up to the student how they're going to go about doing this, but keep record of everything. You know, when did you submit your application for admission? When do you expect to hear back from that college? You know, what did you submit? All of those things are important to keep record of, keep a copy of everything. I, I usually say if you can, you know, print things out and keep a copy of it so that, you know, God forbid something gets lost you have it, you're able to send it to the to the admission office or financial aid office. Know what's required from each of your schools. You know, if a school is requiring test scores and you need to get those directly from the college board, that takes time. Um, so make sure you know what's required so you can do that early enough in the process that they get that information on time and to be able to offer you that earlier admission if that's what you're seeking. So paying attention to what is needed for each of those schools will just help you to be have everything in place when that deadline rolls around. Be consistent. It's really important that you use the same name on everything that you submit um, as you're going through. Also use the same email um, as you're filling out your application for admission and your application for financial aid. Make sure that you're being consistent. So, you know, instead of saying Ben Smith in one place and Benjamin Smith in another, make sure you're just consistent in that. Um, so that nothing gets lost and, and everything is connected in those offices for you. Um, make sure that you attend your school's financial aid night, or you can definitely join us online. We'll have a virtual event, um, statewide event as well. Those dates are right on our, our website. Um, but join you know, one of these financial aid um, nights so that you can get more information about the FAFSA form, the CSS form, if you need to file that, um, and how that process looks, when you will get started in that process, you know, the help that's available out there for you, which, you know, definitely is us for sure, but there are also um, some other folks that are certainly able to help you out there. But under know when that's coming up, check your school's website, check our website for our statewide aid, or give us a call and we can tell you when we're coming to your high school. Um, and then another thing that students can do in terms of the financial aid process now is to create what's called your FSA ID for the FAFSA. The FSA ID is really um, a username and password combination that the student will use to get into the FAFSA form, um, to make any corrections to FAFSA form, um, and to um, apply for their student loans when the time comes. All of that information is gonna be under their ID. Um, parent also needs to have an FSA ID. One parent, if parents are married and file their taxes together, only one parent needs to have an FSA ID. If you file taxes separately, um, you would need to have, each parent would need to have an FSA ID. Um, so just know that that is something that is out there. Questions about that will come through the financial aid process, but that's something that students can start to consider now is that FSA ID. And Lauren, I think a question came in. I just want to make sure that I answer that if it's something that will help everyone. I don't see it. That might just been me putting stuff in the chat. My oh, friend. perfect. <laughs> hey, you're awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks, Lauren. You're on it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Perfect. So, you know, Everything from starting early all the way to that FSA ID are things that our students can really be doing now, um, really getting on top of and really be thinking about to make this process easier for them. So we're going to be available to students and to families. As I said, we are in our offices Monday through Friday. You can meet with us in our office in Concord or we can meet you through a Zoom um, meeting. You can schedule an appointment there you see on the screen, um, calendly.com backslash granted advance. That's our site. Um, you can also send us emails and you can certainly use the telephone to give us a call. That is perfectly fine. Um, but these are all the ways to, to definitely get in touch with us. I encourage you to do so. We have a team of great um, counselors in our office and we're ready to, to help you through this process wherever you are. You know, whether you're just getting started and you need help with that list of schools or you're starting to think about financial aid and you have some questions about that, um, you can give us a call reach out by email or certainly schedule an appointment with us um, and we can get you started. All right, I'm gonna stop talking for just a second and let's see if we get any questions that come in. 
Um, but in the meantime, I would like to thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your busy days. I know it's really hectic at this time of the year. We're back to school and sports are going on and all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of activities for parents and for students. And so thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your busy schedule to join us. Um, we did record this, as I said, so we'll get this up onto our website um, for you to view again, if you wish to, or certainly for folks who weren't able to join us tonight to take a peek at. Lauren, any questions that we can answer? I don't see any. We can Perfect. A second, but so we either scared you or we got <laughs> lots of information out there. It is a lot in a short amount of time to take in. Um, inevitably, you will will sign off. We'll say goodbye to you tonight, and you'll have a question right after. So feel free to use any of these methods to reach out to us in our office tomorrow or at your convenience. Um, no question is a silly question, except those that you don't ask for sure. Looks like we just got a question. Perfect. Do the extracurricular activities have to be through my high school? They do not. Um, a lot of times students will participate in activities at the high school and outside, or for some of our students, they're really just happening outside of the high school. So any activities, anything that you participated in at the high school level, to make sure it's not like middle school or it wasn't elementary school, but at the high school level, anything that you participated in is fair game for those activities and also shows that, you know, that involvement. A lot of times students are out in the community doing things and that's great too. Super questions. We guys have asked a lot of really nice questions and I appreciate that. It makes it a lot more exciting um, when you don't have to listen to me the entire, well, I guess you do, but <laughs> when, when we can interact a little bit and, and answer the questions that you might have. Again, if you find that you have more of those, you know, just reach out to Lauren or myself or one of our other counselors in our office um, at your convenience and we'll make sure we get those uh, questions answered. But th again, thanks for being here, Lauren. Thanks for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. Anytime. Right there.